We have sessions on um, you know, epidemics, Ebola and so on was uh, very high on the agenda. But now we have also, let's say, a man-made uh, epidemic and an epidemic threat. And that's the, an epidemic of um, untreatable infections. And, um, you know, with the question, uh, will we go back in the doom scenario to the area from before there was penicillin? Um, and we'll hear from uh, uh, our experts here um, what the causes are, and particularly what we can do about it. And the good news is that there's real momentum building up um, in terms of uh, awareness, in terms of uh, action uh, at all fronts. Because this problem is extremely complex and uh, requires uh, multiple actors and multiple solutions in order to get it under control. Um, so we had also uh, an industry declaration that just came out uh, yesterday. So that's from the side of the pharmaceutical industry. We have the G7. It was on the, uh, in the, the summit in Germany, was uh, uh, one of the, of the topics. And now we're here. Um, so uh, my, our panel um, is also uh, represents the diversity of the issue. We have Andrew Witte, CEO of uh, uh, JSK. Um, Minister Schippers from the Netherlands, Minister of Health, and other Minister of Health from uh, Minister Gro, uh, as uh, you know, the Minister of Health of the G7, um, Jeremy Farrar from the um, Welcome Trust Director, and Joan Liu from as President of uh, MSF Médecins Sans Frontières. Um, let me start with asking uh, Jeremy, um, how do you see things? What's the problem? Thanks very much, Peter, um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, <coughs> there is obviously a huge problem. We, it's been um, talked about many times, but I'd like to start on a bit of an optimistic note. If you, we are not passive observers of history. If you identify an issue and then you work towards solutions, you can change the course of things. And I think we're at that tipping point now, where if we make the right choices, we can actually change the dynamic of what's happening. I think I'd like to frame it, we need to think of it in infectious diseases, but we need to be aware that all of the progress that's being made in some of the non-communicable diseases, the major breakthroughs in cancer therapy, diabetes care, surgery, all of these are actually dependent on, on antibiotics. And so therefore, we cannot just frame this in the context of infectious diseases, and we cannot just frame this in the context of the lower middle income countries. This truly affects everybody, and I believe we're at that tipping point, where if we act, we can have an optimistic scenario. If we fail to act, we could be into doomsday. We portray this as a market failure, and I think sometimes a market failure is a bad use of terms. I think this is a failure of public health, and I think we're going to need a new contract between the public sector, the private sector, academia, philanthropy, in order to address this. This is just not a failure of industry. Industry is undoubtedly part of the solution, but it is going to have to change its models of working in order to address issues around um, access in particular. I'd like to frame it in, in five areas. Firstly, we have to learn how to conserve what we've got in a better way. That means prevention, uh, it means changes of behaviour, it means engagement with society, uh, and it means, of course, things like vaccination. We have to involve both the human and animal sector because the vast majority of antibiotics are actually used in the animal sector uh, and the resistance comes through into the human sector and vice versa. And we've got to frame it in terms of innovation in research and development, whether in new drugs, in conserving ex existing drugs, or in the development of preventative measures. And we've got to understand the value of this class of, uh, of interventions. We've on the whole talked about them in they have to be cheap and they have to be affordable, and that's very, very important. But we also have to truly value their contribution to modern medicine. And that's going to require changes in the way we see volume and access uh, and we're going to have to require policy changes, and that gets back to my comment about public health. So I believe we need this new contract between industry, between uh, the public sector, and with society in order to value what we've got, conserve what we've got, and develop new approaches. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Jeremy. That's very clear. So, Skippers, the good news is also that uh, antimicrobial resistance has made it to the, uh, the political level, because uh, without that we won't be able to... Um, to move and uh, particularly the reports also uh, by Jim O'Neill in the UK have been really instrumental in waking up uh, you know the world to say so so how do you see things from your position as Minister of Health? I think we had also a momentum 10 years ago but we failed 
to be determined enough to mm. uh, make uh, big steps and solutions. Yeah. It's a global problem. Uh, that is an advantage, but also uh, one of the difficult uh, things to solve. Secondly, I think it's um, uh, a silent killer. Ebola, we talk a lot, everybody is talking about it, uh, seeking for solutions. But antibiotic resistance, we talk a lot about it, but the public in the street, the citizens don't know. So I think it's very crucial for us also to make them aware about prevention, prudent use, but also about that we have a problem with each other. Because if they don't know we have a problem, they're not, not open for solutions either. And the solutions are not only in the medical world. They're also very necessary to make measures to take action in the veterinarian world. And that's also very uh, a topic that is, that is very uh, sensitive, uh, sensitive in many countries. Because it means that also farmers have to change the way they have their business models, the way they uh, treat their livestock. Uh, no preventive use of antibiotics or and, uh, for a whole cattle. Uh, not uh, uh, using antibiotics um, uh, as a grow um, uh, facilitator to, 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 to see how uh, growing gets faster. So the one health approach is also necessary, but also difficult. And um, uh, for, uh, last, I want to make a, a real comment, we need to make, come from paper to, paper to implementation because we have a lot of sessions and we talk how important it is to make a solution. So as a president of the uh, European Union, we organize in February a conference for the first time in its existence between ministers of health and ministers of agriculture to mm. see how we can really make solutions and come from paper to action. Not to have a national action plan, but to implement your national action plan. To have peer reviews, not to control each other, but to help each other, to see obstacles and see how we can overcome them. And of course, also very important, new business models, new working together in PPP with the industry to see how we can get new alternatives and new uh, antibiotics, not to use them, but to have them when we need them. All very good uh, points for we need action. Now, Joanne, and you're not only president of uh, MSF, but you're also still a practicing emergency physician. You go there where the patients are. How do you see things? Well, for us, you know, as, as I would say a first line uh, worker is the big driver for antibiotic use is fever. And then uh, I think it's the same everywhere. And our main issue about fever is the fact that we don't know what are the causes of fever. So somehow we overuse antibiotic. So we see it, you know, right away now in, in Pakistan, 80% of our newborns have in their bloodstream when they come with fever, resistance, uh, bacteria. Same thing, you know, we have appalling figures in Amman where our well wounded patient come with a 55% misdrug resistance when they have osteomyelitis. So we are seeing the same ridiculous situation that we will save a patient from his, uh, in Syria from his amputation, but he's gonna die from his pneumonia. Mm. But in Montreal, my old relative will be safe from his triple bypass, but he's gonna die from his pneumonia. So it's the same category of problem, and we probably can find similar solution that would benefit everybody. The, the reality is in the developing countries and, and less developed countries, we don't know the scale of the issue. We have no micro data, especially at the primary healthcare. So what we see you know, in our context of work, it's everything is magnified, easy. Earthquake, slums, rural, remote area, it's, it's, it's crisis time. And so patients are either not immunized, they malnourish. Remember the Madaya children? So when we see those patients, we have only one shot because they will not gonna come, they won't come back. They won't cross another front line to come and see me. So by default, often we overuse antibiotic. So solution, I was thinking about that. And see, good, there are solutions upstream and downstream. And there are like technical solution and political solution. On the technical side, upstream, is we, we have vaccine. We know that the pneumococcal vaccine, you know, if we are using it, will prevent lower respiratory tract infection. It just needs to be available uh, for all the countries. We need to do more infection control. We need to, uh, in our healthcare facilities, we need mini lab to be able to identify the bugs. But 
we all know that all we've talked about, it's so difficult to change behavior. It's so difficult. And then we've seen it you know, with, with HIV, we've seen it with malaria. But what we have achieved from 2000 to 2015 is we decreased by 60% the mortality rate uh, in uh, malaria because we have the right uh, new diagnostic test, mm -hmm. rapid diagnostic test, and the treatment. So we need new rapid diagnostic tests for fever that will differentiate you know, a viral illness from a bacterial illness, or at least will tell us the, which one are the severe bacterial infection. And this will allow to treat the patient who need antibiotic, and the one that, that doesn't need it won't get it. This would be the real game changer. And then downstream, we need new drugs, of course. So all those tools, if we find them, they're going to benefit everybody. Last point, it's about political solution. It's the global security agenda is driven by national self-interest. We've seen it in Ebola. We're still seeing it in the migrant refugee crisis, and we're still about the Middle East. But drug resistance infection is not about security. It's not about national interest. It's about health. It's about saving lives. It's about government taking action because health is a public good. And it, we need, we, they need to provide. But the reality, we're working in failed state. And so we need the right trigger to work in those states. And our issue is we don't think that fear can be the driving force. We have, we've seen in Ebola, we just cannot hack when nations feel threatened. So we need political will beyond self-interest to find the right trigger. So my summary, hashtag rapid diagnostic test for fever, hashtag health is public good. Thank you. Thank you. That's the, uh, <coughs> the mother way of address addressing it. And also thanks for putting it in context, but also diagnostics. I mean, the UK, there is the longitude price, which is, uh, uh, you know, has uh, launched a prize for actually exactly that, to discover a, um, a rapid, uh, inexpensive diagnostic point of care, and that would uh, rationalize the use of antibiotics and thereby also limit the spread of uh, uh, infectious, uh, in, in resistant infections. Andrew, we had the, uh, the declaration of the uh, industry, so companies are taking up the challenge, uh, although after years, there was not much investment in antibiotic development. So how? Well, just maybe just um, highlight a couple of points. So, so the declaration that was published mm -hmm. yesterday, I think it's pretty unprecedented actually. I think there's about 85 private industry companies now, biotech, large companies, mm -hmm. uh, many companies, some involved, some not directly involved in the space, all signing up to very much the kind of themes you've just heard actually from all three of the previous commentators um, in terms of conf uh, conservance, in terms of focusing on things like diagnostics, in terms, on, in terms of uh, thinking about how to develop the marketplace to be responsible, but at the same time incentivize. So that's all in there. I'd, I'd like to, I'm sure we'll come back to some of those. I'd just like to drive the focus a little bit, at least in these comments, on something which I think is a little bit taken for granted, which is that actually discovering new effective antibiotics is really difficult. Mm. <laughs> really, really difficult. Mm. We've been in antibiotic research since the early 1940s and we've never stopped. In fact, in the last decade at GSK, we spent a billion US dollars on antibiotic research in the company. And I'm very pleased to say that we have a new a first in class product about to go to file, looks excellent, highly effective in plague, tells you something immediately, the fact that we're developing a, a, an antibiotic in plague, when was the last time anybody talked about plague? Um, great collaboration with BARDA, US and other organizations to make that happen. But the point of that antibiotic is its future is likely to go towards things like complicated gonorrhea and the kind of very difficult infections which we're starting to see around the world. So we're there. Now we did some work, we looked back over our history over the last nine or 10 years and we were able to get, we worked with one or two other big farmers and we looked at three companies between the three companies, on average, over the period of nine or 10 years, we'd done something like 60 or 70 high throughput screens in the antibiotic space to look for particularly gram-negative antibiotics. So about 200 HTS interventions. So HTS essentially is um, screening your molecular libraries. So in our case, that's probably 2 million chemical structures. Now you then say, okay, the other two companies, let's imagine they have broadly similar kind of volumes. You're talking gigantic amounts of data to be trying to be exposed to look for starting points for products. Out of the 200 high throughput screens in three different companies over a period of nine years, there were precisely 
zero hits. Now, that's not because we're all completely stupid. It's because it's a really, really difficult space to make progress. So that the bit I'd like to just draw attention to is, first of all, just by writing checks out isn't going to solve anything. I honestly don't believe that. I think what this is really about, at the first point, and this obviously is what will give us some cause for optimism in 10, 15, 20 years, not tomorrow morning, we have got to drive some really strong basic science coming from academia, in research, in biotech, everywhere, in the normal way, if I can put it that way. We have got to drive a greater level of open innovation. We've managed to construct some very interesting semi-open relationships with Sanofi. I think Olivier is in the room with where we've seen some great progress there with the two teams working together. We've seen a much broader open academic collaboration with multiple companies involved. What do we need to focus on? Gram negative. How to get drug load into patients without creating toxicity because even when we do find a hit, the drug load is driving too much host toxicity and it kills the programs. How many times have you turned on the radio in the morning and heard a university professor claim they've discovered the first new class of antibiotics in 20 years? How many of those classes have been launched? And they all go down on drug tox because we're killing the host quicker than we're killing the bug. So that, that for me is a big space. So uh, something around academic industrial collaboration, how to energize, which bridges you to the market incentivization. How do we turn on the biotech sector? How do we turn on that incredibly inventive layer of companies who bridge ideas out of universities? How do we get them excited in this space at a scale which really moves things forward? And then how do we get lessons learned so that we've got pre-competitive understanding on things like tox management, all of the things which are killing these drugs as they come through the system, just as we've done through things like IMI uh, and other programs in things like liver tox on traditional small molecule non-antibiotics. So that's a big focus for us. Vaccination is a huge opportunity. We, we, we think, I think Lancet published recently, that effective PCV vaccination reduces subsequent antibiotic use by about half something like that, huge impact. We're very committed to try and do our part to make that happen. The, the role of Gavi in the advanced market commitment, which without which there would be no PCV vaccination of scale going on in the developing world is an extraordinary example where the right intervention can absolutely drive the right behavior. It's not perfect, but it can really move things in the right direction. I don't know if that's what we need to do in antibiotics, probably not but we should be inspired by the idea that we did something in a field, it worked, we should, we should scratch our heads to come up with what the version of that is in this space. Yeah, so also um, innovation is really going to be important, but also I think we, we may have to look at what's all still on the shelf and which we don't use, uh, combination therapy, and then, and then your point about vaccines, I mean, someone who doesn't get a child, doesn't develop pneumonia, this we see is a pneumonia, a vaccine against uh, uh, pneumococcal pneumonia doesn't need antibiotics. Yeah. So it's, it's like contraception saves mothers, uh, reduces I mean, maternal just, mortality. Just, just, to, <laughs> just to your point about on the shelf, I think I'm right in saying that the PD-1 inhibitors, which are creating the most extraordinary yeah. excitement in immune yes. oncology, have been on the shelf a while. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> took, yeah. As molecules. Yeah. Right. Took, us a, took a while to figure out their role. But it, you know, that is what we need. And yeah. we've seen it in TB, actually. I think in TB, where mm. almost nothing happened really, really, really for 20 or 30 years, as there's been a mobilization of, frankly, you know, the uh, Bill, and, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Welcome, the Trescantos operation that we run, all of the various, uh, that opening up of thinking and that plurality of innovation, we're now starting to see some real yeah. prospects yeah. of something in tuberculosis, yeah. tuberculosis and malaria yeah. also. Yeah. So I think, yeah. I think there are good reasons to be inspired. The question now is, as Edith said, how do we connect the words yeah. and the aspiration on antibiotics to some of the models which we know work and how do we just shape those a bit and then start industrializing it and making something happen? Right. They go to scale. So, Minister Goya, Germany has been really uh, in a strong leadership position on this. Uh, can you tell a bit about what you're doing, the plans and the action that uh, your colleague from yes, the thank Netherlands you. calls? Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would agree with you, Peter, that we have a momentum. In Germany, people were surprised that the G7 summit of the heads of state and government addressed an issue like AMR. And suddenly it was not only an expert issue, but it was in public 
debate for a while. And I hope that by the work that is done now by the Dutch presidency in the European Union, as a, it's not just a firework, but it's continuing to be an issue that is uh, to be addressed uh, strictly. It had mentioned uh, correctly uh, the work of a silent killer. It's not like an earthquake everybody can see. It's similar maybe to climate change, that you are slipping in a catastrophe without seeing in that direct way, like a Vulcan or an earthquake, that dramatic things are happening. I would divide the things we are debating now and those where it's a question of political will, of preparedness to change behavior, Jan mentioned. I would describe the whole area of prudent use, one health approach, um, um, good stewardship, mostly being a question of political will. We know about hygiene, about um, um, diminishing misuse, one health approach. These things are thought through in a way, but they need to be implemented. And uh, that is that area where we have a lot of things to do. Of course, also a new invention where we talk about fast speed diagnosis to help prudent use. There is also need of new intellectual work, but I would say mainly to say it's needed to have one health approach. It's a question of political will. When it comes to the point Andrew Witte uh, mentioned, a lot of intellectual work is still in front of us. I think uh, the market failure, Jeremy Farrow um, mentioned that we asked Andrew Witte and his team, invest a lot. If you have something to fight super bucks, please sell it carefully. Uh, that's not an easy business model, of course. So the way how to de-link uh, the profitability and the quantity of sales is an intellectual challenge for a market economy, for using market powers for innovative uh, activities. And so we have to uh, debate these models. There are some on the table. We used our G7 presidency to ask the OECD and the Boston Consulting Group to make studies about incentives they are uh, all available on our website because we want to make it a public debate, not just an expert issue, how we can use <coughs> prices like uh, uh, the price that is uh, the award that is made by the UK government. The question of a market entry award, could that be one or not? We uh, see the contribution of the declaration published by uh, the pharmaceutical industry uh, yesterday, uh, this morning. Uh, to be frank, we have to debate about details. Some of it is a commitment, thank you. Some of it is a request. We have to debate that. And we de when we debate about fair risk sharing, for example, you were talking a lot about predictable market conditions. If we take uh, the risk by the public sector in a new way of uh, public-private partnership, what is the benefit for the public side? For example, the affordability for those in need, even if they cannot be the high price payers. So I think we need to balance out in a, in a fair way, we have not too much time, how to reach that delinkage between uh, investment in research, profitability on the one side, but also clearly uh, to have, um, have a predictability that makes it possible. Thank you very much, Herman, to, to really to highlight these um, very practical, quote unquote, details, but that's what will make or break the, the whole you know, the, the, the new uh, innovation that we, that we need. And, and Jim O'Neill's report has some very practical proposals, but again, have to be worked out. And there has to be um, not only consensus, but agreement uh, about that. Um, one point I'd like to make is that um, we should also not forget that there are still millions of people who do not have access to antibiotics, to life-saving ones. And, uh, and as a result, there are uh, people who die from kind of pretty banal very treatable infection. So we have to really work on both sides. I mean, access where it's, where it's none, and then making sure this rational use that uh, we don't create that pressure. Maybe, it's, Peter, yeah, I yeah, can sure. just add a, a short point. We talked during the G7 summit and during the G7 health ministers meeting about supporting WHO in implementing IHR. And here there is a link. Mm -hmm. If we talk, for example, about obligatory prescription, Yes. We need, of course, a basic structure also in poorer countries to implement such an obligatory prescription. 
And oh, that yeah. means we have not only to take health care, but really health system put in yeah. place in states in yeah. Africa and elsewhere. And the G7 summit declared that they want to reach the aim to stop 60 countries yes. in implementing IHR. And we will, in the end of the presidency, we will publish. And I'm confident, but it's still work to be done that we reach that aim because it's needed to have prudent um, stewardship, not only in rich countries, to enable countries to have these fundamental things started with uh, obligatory prescription, with hygiene, and all these uh, basic fundamental things. Absolutely, and as I said, it is a, a global issue. And, and I'd like to support what Joanne said, and that is that uh, you know, this is not only about global health security, and these initiatives, if one can link um, epidemic preparedness, and tomorrow there will be a, a big session on that, mm -hmm. with um, surveillance and action on antimicrobial resistance, I think that's a very rational yes. use of, of resources. If these things are going to be handled in, in parallel, it's going to be a waste uh, of resources. So. Okay, the floor is open for discussion. We, there's a lot to discuss. And please identify yourself and, uh, and limit your intervention also to uh, very, well, one minute. Okay, yes, Francis. Please, you, sir, you have the behind, yeah. You're first and then Francis. My name is uh, Stefan Tanda. I'm a board member of Royal DSM. Uh, we've been producing antibiotics for 70 years, uh, proudly, um, and in a very clean biotechnology manner. Very much welcome uh, the O'Neill report. Thank you for uh, supporting that. And uh, the one additional comment I wanted to make is I uh, missed in all your discussion one of the points that the O'Neill report highlighted, which is there's a third major source of antimicrobial uh, resistance next to human overuse and animal use it is heavy pollution in the manufacturing of antibiotics, mm. particularly in the developing world. Uh, if you YouTube polluting to heal, polluting to heal, it's a documentary made by an investment management company, Nordea. Um, I don't need to describe anything else. And I think you need that third pillar in your efforts, and I would ask the minister, Skippers, uh, in, the, in the February event to add that third pillar to address this issue. We are fully behind you. Uh, we offer tests. We uh, discourage all use in animals. We offer alternatives to antibiotics. We need to get at that, but we need to get it with all three pillars. And to be honest, the polluting is a major pillar. We source many products from uh, those countries, uh, not for medis medical use, but the other uses, and often e there are trace amounts of antibiotics because it's everywhere in the water uh, from those pollutions. Thank you. Thank you. Very good point. Uh, to, uh, Francis Collins, please. Hi, Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health in the U.S. I certainly welcome the momentum that we see represented by this group here gathered this morning about a problem which, as has been said, has been with us for a while, but we haven't really pulled all the resources together in the way that we need to. From NIH's perspective, uh, we're fortunate that in the recent budget, uh, we were granted an extra $100 million to work specifically on antimicrobial resistance and look forward to working in partnership with all of you in that regard. I really welcome the comments uh, from Andrew Witte about the opportunity for additional open innovation partnerships about discovery. There are some interesting things happening there, uh, such as the use of uh, chips to discover soil microbes that are making natural products, uh, which we didn't know about before, like Tyxobactin. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have methods for doing toxicity testing that are perhaps more rapid uh, than what we've had in the past, and I certainly recognize the need for that if we're going to be able to identify compounds that are actually useful for human use. Uh, we also, uh, as the UK, uh, have put out a prize uh, for rapid ability to detect resistance, particularly from gram-negative rods, uh, so that in the clinical setting one knows when you're dealing with a highly resistant organism. One pitch, though, I'd like to make is for databases. The more that we can collect genomic information, which is not that complicated or expensive anymore, on resistant organisms to develop a national, international database of what's out there, the more rapidly we'll be able to understand the epidemiology uh, of how these particular organisms are spreading and how their resistance is encoded. And uh, presently, that still hasn't quite come together that way that it might. Finally, I might say clinical trials remain a challenge because you would like to have ready to go 
uh, examples of people who are infected with highly resistant organisms, whether it's pneumonia or urinary tract infection or septicemia, so that when a drug is ready for testing, you don't have to try to line up those individuals, which is very complicated and difficult to do. And I don't think that's a solved problem, but we're certainly interested in international collaboration around that space as well. Yeah. Thanks, Francis. All very practical um, options, and, and congratulations on the budget for NIH in general. <laughs> uh, uh, hallelujah. Um, uh, Seth uh, Berkeley, please. Uh, Th thank you, Peter. And I just want to build on some of the comments that Andrew and others made. Um, it's interesting you talked about the pneumococcal vaccine. Um, uh, pneumococcal resistance began in South Africa. It was interesting as they rolled out the seven-valent pneumococcal vaccine, we saw a drop, obviously, in pneumococcal disease, but we also saw the pressure from antibiotics going away, and we saw resistance disappearing. As they moved to a higher valent vaccine, we saw the drop again. But the other point you didn't make, which I think is really important, is that if you get rid of the disease in the children, the elderly then don't get infected. And of course, that's the problem. This was the old man's friend always. And so, you know, we've rolled out the vaccine in 54 countries now. We're trying to do the same thing with rotavirus vaccine, which is also obviously in diarrhea, overuse of antibiotics. So I think as we think about not only antibiotics, we have to think about creating new vaccines, which there'll be some sessions here uh, as well, but then what are the mechanisms to make sure that these are made rapidly available? And the AMC was interesting because within one year of the new pneumococcal vaccines coming out, they were rolled out in the developing world, unprecedented. All good point and illustrating we need more than just new antibiotics. Yes, yes please, do we have two uh, requests here on the front? Jeremy Garrett Cox from the UK. Could I maybe follow on from that, just maybe ask the panel for some comment on the ability and the challenges of delivering new vaccines that's been mentioned on a, uh, on a number of uh, comments earlier uh, in today's discussion. And secondly, within that, within the, the ability to speed vaccines to the market, is the framework, the regulatory framework, right to enable, it or, uh, to enable uh, the challenges to, to achieve an approved vaccine um, and by that, I mean the, the burden of proof of negative proof, i.e. proving what a vaccine doesn't do to be able to, we'll to enable it to get to market. We'll come back to it when we have a panel discussion afterwards, you know. Um, so let's see. We can, yes, please. Give the floor. Uh, my name is Carolina Sachs. I'm from Axe Foundation, a Swedish-based foundation. Oh, okay. And we are running a big project that is um, industry-driven from the retail, food retail sector on uh, the use of antibiotics to land-based animals. And what my worry is, uh, who's re really taking the lead in this subject? Because we have the WHO, and we have the FAO, and we have lots of different, uh, but who's really taking the lead? So we won't have like a climate discussion that goes on for years until we get to an actual deal that needs to be taken probably in the UN assembly. But that is really my, who's yeah. taking the lead? And yeah. I think we really need the lead to get fast action. I agree. I think that's why it has to be at the political level. That goes beyond any sector. And, uh, but we'll go around first, and uh, we have Paul Stoffels, I see, and then Mary Paul Kimi. Well, we developed a new antibiotic, a new drug for XDR, MDR, TB, <coughs> bedaquiline. <coughs> Sorry, so from... Um, J &J from well, Janssen. Post Office from Johnson & Johnson yeah. Janssen. Um, we developed a new drug for uh, an ATP synthase, a very unexpected target for, uh, for TB, only for TB, MDR TB and Lepra. Um, I must say, with fantastic collaboration from the regulators in the world, we did a very accelerated program, one phase 2B study with the FDA. The FDA approved it today. It's available in many countries, XDRTB, um, uh, mainly Russia, South Africa, um, in Southern Africa. Um, but the challenge is, of course, then you have to limit to really XDRTB. So first we went to the CDC. Within six months, guidance only for that area. Then with the WHO, within six months, guidance only for that area. We priced it very responsible so that it was accessible. But you end up with a non-commercial, non-viable product. Yeah? And that you can, it shows that you can get to new antibiotics fast if needed. But we have to find a way to do that much broader than a one-time off. Yeah? And uh, basic research, the regulatory part is there, the clinical part is there, but the right incentives 
we got a voucher, an accelerated review voucher from the FDA, which is an incentive, but it's not big enough to ma massively mobilize the industry. And I think the industry, and I agree with Andrew, we can do a lot in order to bring new antibiotics if we work together with the basic research institutions, the academia, and, and the regulators. Um, but the experience is good when you have one, you get it there. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul. And uh, Marie Paul Kinney from the World Health Organization. Just in Thank you. Indeed, as was discussed, this is an, this is an area which is beyond health alone. And, uh, and there has been a request uh, to the Secretary General to organize a high-level meeting on AMR in September in, in the UNGA. So I hope that this will, again, incentivize all sectors to work together. So at WHO on the Global Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance, we work already with OIE and, uh, and, and FAO. But, uh, but you know, we need, we need more of that. So, uh, there needs also to be a, a few experiments to work on to work out new systems to uh, and new models. So we have just launched DNDI and WHO, the Drug for ne ne Neglected Diseases Initiative, and WHO, an initiative to look at existing drugs, to look at combination of those, to look at drugs for children. And we hope that this is this will be another approach in addition to developing new antibiotics to find mm. new uh, avenues to treat people. And this will also also give an opportunity to test new model for, for stewardship. Uh, how can these be preserved in the future? Thank you very much. Thank you, Marie Paul. And I, I think um, let's uh, address some of the questions and the, that, that came up. And uh, um, some, I think, is a very important one on uh, where will all this be uh, taken on that, um, you know, since it is not only One Health, but it uh, will involve and uh, lots of individuals. I was quite interested by what you said it, it about the, the EU initiative where you bring at least the Minister of Health and Minister of Agriculture together and also you have accountability. Can you say a bit more about that and then indeed what uh, Marie Paul says? So how, how do you see that? Because it is an important question. Where will it all come together um, I, I politically? Think that, that you need to have a dialogue between the Ministers of Ag Agriculture and health and also environment. But I think we, we invested as Dutch government quite a lot of money in uh, investigations in uh, the uh, environmental yeah. uh, impact. But I think that um, it's important to have this dialogue not only in health but between different sectors and also to put it on the agenda of the General Assembly of the United Nations because you can't solve this as a country alone, so you need leadership, political leadership, uh, internationally. And so you had the G7, we are all members of uh, WHO, uh, WHO works together with FIO and OID. So this is the way to go on a political level to see how you can make not only strategics and not only agreements, but the second step, uh, I say it again, is implementation. We, can, we make all kinds of declarations and mm. we sign this, but we really have to implement them. And we have also to see that other countries uh, overcome obstacles that they meet. And we know these obstacles from each other so we can share how to overcome them. So I really think that an open, transparent dialogue on a political level is very important for AMR. And I'm very happy that it's not only a problem of ministers of health, because then we won't solve this problem. We really need to involve the cabinets. We really need to involve the international political um, decision makers. Absolutely. And I think your point about that, um, learning from each other is important. We particularly use in um, promotion of uh, growing of uh, animals and uh, prevention of uh, infections. Uh, it's a huge economic issue, but there are countries that have managed to do it, to control it, without, let's say, economic damage to the farmers. I mean, Denmark yeah, and Sweden. And you had in several yeah, years. Exactly. But it was not a Dutch invention. We yeah. looked at Denmark exactly. and saw how Denmark yeah. did it. And then, yeah. of course, it was not copy-paste, but we uh, yeah. translated it to the Dutch situation. And so we can learn from each other. And then, really, you can make big steps. That's because important. 60% a lower uh, use of antibiotics in, uh, uh, and we are still the, s the second larger exporters of agricultural products. So it doesn't 
mean mm. that you have a bad, um, uh, your business call case worsens. Exactly. That's why I think also a peer review can be very useful, yeah. not to, you know, to punish anybody, but to learn. Yes, Herman, you have a the a global action plan uh, made in Geneva last year during the World Health Assembly is a good framework. Right. And it was connected with OIE and others uh, that brought in their expertise. So I think there is a framework. But during, it was during the World Health Assembly that we launched with some colleagues this initiative to the UN General Secretary to make that high-level meeting also at the General uh, Assembly because we believe that it should be on that level also to be visible for all sectors. That's the first thing. Uh, concerning what Edith mentioned, learn from each other. One of the small steps we did during the G7 work was to make a best practice uh, brochure for all of us in G7 and uh, brought it also to other friends and mm. just to show what we can learn. We can learn if we debate with our farmers. We immediately hear, hey, what's with those in the Netherlands and Denmark mm. and all these others. Yes. If we yeah. do it together yeah. uh, and we learn from each other, it's much easier. And the last point since it was mentioned, the collaboration with regulatory work, we have on the German side, we have a dialogue between pharmaceutical industry academia and the government that will uh, finish its work with a report in April and we have a working group there especially on the regulatory framework on antibiotics so what we can do on the national side is now under um, debate and we will publish that and we will look what are the needed international steps that should be added. Jeremy. Can I just pick up on um, a comment Francis made, Francis Collins just made, and that's around data. There's no doubt mm. the world's so-called experts know of this problem. Um, but the truth is the, the willingness to engage on this outside that group of experts. We, we've talked too long amongst ourselves and not enough mm -hmm. with either the general public or, or I think the policymakers. If you look at the recent emergence uh, of the E. coli resistance in, in Asia over the when people have then gone back, that, that bug has been around for more than six years. Um, and yet our data around the world has not been sufficiently in time and shared sufficiently, and then the benefits of sharing that information sufficiently robust for allow us to, that, if that had, bug had been able to transmit easily between people, it would be worldwide by now and would be causing a major problem. And that is going to happen. This has to be, the data around the world has to be uh, shared, and the benefits of sharing that data uh, in terms of access to subsequent uh, science and, and uh, benefits has also to be shared. But unless we know what's going on and we talk beyond the experts, we won't be able to transform this. Agreed. So let's make that a, uh, an objective for 2016 to yeah, get it off the ground. NIH, yeah, um, I know. Ourselves, exactly. um, yeah. The Fleming Fund from the UK, uh, the Chinese government are, mm. and WHO talking about now a, a, a global observatory where the data will be shared. And right. I think that has to be one of the, yeah. the critical things that we, we move forward. Yeah, I think it needs a bit of a, a, a push so that it becomes reality. John, you had uh, some reflections on this? Or? No, no, I, no. I, okay, I, I you had some, the same point. Please, yeah. 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 Okay, One yes. short remark. I'll, I'll we debated it now in WHO, in the EU, in the G7. Since in 2017, there is the G20 presidency in Germany, so far, G20 was not a, a debate on healthcare issues. In general, and if we see yeah. that, we see there uh, the uh, huge developing countries with great agricultural sectors. It's, it's, it's really a needed oh, yeah. platform for yeah. combined things of the industrialized and the mm. developing countries, mm. the huge agricultural states. So I hope that uh, these G20 can also be used to be an instrument for that. I think it's absolutely crucial and it's only I think last year or so in, in Australia was the first time first health time was there because of Ebola. But so let's make Ebola the game changer for that because it mm -hmm. has to be on. Well, vaccines were mentioned also. John, you wanted to about introduction of new yeah. vaccines. But I just wanted to answer uh, you about some of your questions. I think it's, we, we know how challenging it is and then we, we, we know what you know, people are, the different pharmaceutical industries going through. Uh, the reality for us is, and then we have to keep, you know, the global picture is 80% of the world is basically living in less developed countries. So somehow we need to find things that works in their, those countries. And so um, 
And, and acknowledging all the difficulty, my still pitch on that is the fact that vaccines need to be adapted to some part of the world. And then so we need to be adapted to the strain of where it is. It's not the same everywhere. The strains in Africa is not the same uh, that in Asia or in the, north, in the in northern hemisphere. And the, the other thing is it's, it, it's needs to, it needs to be uh, as well um, uh, thermostable because this is our challenge in Africa. And so one of the thing is, is we, we have to go, and I know there's the, the usual suspect who develop things, but what we've realized, there's other industry that are able to develop. And then and it's in, in Asia, India, and, and, and China, just to take a few examples. And then MSF, you know, for retrovirus, for example, we develop something that is, that is strains adapted to Africa, that is thermostable, and then hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go through the pre-qualification. So, but what, what I want you to realize is, is we may develop some things that is good for one part of the world, but that might be a minority, it's like a, a fraction of the world. And 80% of the world is in less developed world. And so you need to develop as well tools that will benefit uh, as well this part of the population. Because anyway, it's going to backfire eventually. So it, it's, we, 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 we need to look at the global picture. Mm -hmm. So uh, just, to, just to tell you that that's my take on vaccine. Yeah. There's another dimension there, and that's uh, public trust believes in some, and that's in, uh, in, in high-income countries particularly. We have measles epidemics in Europe. <laughs> we had one in Disneyland, so that uh, got a lot of attention. Um, in Berlin. Yes, there, is the, there are children dying today in Europe from vaccine-preventable uh, infections. There's zero excuse for that. It's a, and, uh, but it's because of a lack of trust in, and confidence in lots of things, science I, I and so on. I see that in my ER all the time, having to convince my pa parents to, to vaccinate their children. You see. And, and yeah. I, I just want to make one point, you know, set yes. is gone for Gavi. I just want, because MSF has been portrayed that, you know, we don't like the idea of Gavi and all that. You know, actually, we love Gavi to a certain extent. <laughs> but the thing is, we just want to expand it to other countries that are in crisis, that's not only the low-income countries, yeah. but today, you know, we are facing the reality that in the Middle East, we're gonna be with a crisis that's probably gonna last for a decade. And then these are middle-income countries, and they need to have access yeah. to vaccine at cheap price. That's it, that's, yeah. that's, that's, we, we want Syrian little children to have access to vaccine as well. It's not only important for the Middle East, but for the surrounding countries also, I should, I should say. Yeah. And coming back to my point, public trust, is this example of uh, human papillomavirus vaccine. It's a vaccine that yes. prevents cancer. In Japan today, the coverage is below 1%. It collapsed because of rumors, because mm. people think this causes, I don't know what, in yeah. uh, mm. girls and so on, besides then the whole paranoia side. Why is polio still not eliminated? It, it's not a technical issue. It's because of war and of you know, trust and polio workers being killed. So I think it's again an, an area that you cannot address just uh, in a technical fashion. Yeah. Now, we, yes, we, uh, we have I, I didn't know MSF and minutes, Garvey yes. didn't like each other, or, but it sounds as if you've fallen back in love together, which is great news. Uh, but, but I think we, we sometimes, we, that we, too far. <laughs> we sometimes so become cynical now. about the ability of global organizations to pull things together in the modern world. But just a, a, a very strong push for keeping the idealism that came out of the Second World War those global organizations may not be functioning as well as they could, but they still are a critical player to bring everybody together and make sure this is not just addressed through the narrow prism of national security, but this is yeah. addressed through the prism of global health. And I, and I think we have to keep a sight of that idealism yeah. that came out of the Second World War. Uh, these organizations are needed more than ever, in fact, to bring us all together. I and think, Garvey's a very good example yeah. of that. No, I, I think your point is absolutely uh, important. And it's even... Uh, there's even a stronger need than just after World War II because the world is far more connected, mobility is higher, etc. So there's no, no doubt about that. And, and this year is the year of the replenishment of the Global Fund to fight HTB malaria. The, the results have been spectacular. Yep. It's rare that you can count uh, so many lives uh, saved. And uh, so it's, it's a, a year, there's a lot of demand on resources, but uh, that is crucial. Um, we have uh, about good five minutes. Uh, can I ask uh, each of the, my fellow panel members to, what is your thought, what, uh, what you, would you like to see uh, happening, action, uh, this year in, uh, in terms to move the agenda? We're not going to solve this in one year, 
But what could we do this year? Who would like to start with that? Maybe Edith, since you, uh, you have something very concrete that I... I uh, think that we uh, um, uh, have to be uh, aware that we don't make the same mistake as we did, uh, fault as we did 10 years ago. So mm -hmm. be determined to really make steps. And it's very important to um, work together and to allow, for example, peer reviews, not only between European countries, because in the global health security agenda, we also have peer right. reviews. We also have that you sign up to help other countries to make their systems uh, more robust, robust and uh, uh, efficient and uh, to, to help them to prevent uh, for antibiotic resistance. So I really think that we have a lot of actions and a lot of paper, but I keep mm. repeating, come from paper to implementation. That is really, mm. I think, the core business for the coming year. Yeah. Great. I would say last year, uh, the Ebola crisis as a wake-up call made public he uh, uh, global health a global issue. We have to prove this year that this is not a one-year firework. Right. And that if we talk now about terrorism, about refugees, and all these things, and some of them had much more common ground with these global health issues and people think about that we prove this year, for example, by taking our promises during the World Health Assembly that every state should have a national plan to go that way mm -hmm. and uh, this year is crucial to make it really a process. So it is going to be a crucial year. Jeremy. I think my worry at the moment is that this space is too fragmented. We've got the human sector, we've got the animal sector, we've got industry, academia, philanthropy, etc. I, I think if we're going to truly change this, and it has to be at a global level, we've got to rise it above microbiologists, infectious disease people like myself, and to a different level yeah. within the political discussion, yeah. so that this is actually something owned, yes, at the level that climate change is owned at, at the political level. And if we don't do that, we won't get the changes in regulation, we won't get the changes of the human animal sector, we won't get the incentive for industry and we won't get the uh, control of the use but also access so I'd like to see it raised above uh, the level of experts to a higher political level yeah. and owned somewhere with accountability yeah very good yeah Sean well you told me that I have to use slip sentence but I know if I had to use buzzword for me for this year it would be innovation for access is whatever we're going to do mm. needs to be accessible and mm. it needs to be accessible for everybody but of course you know Jeremy said you know idealisms and MSF we're full of that idealism but if we were not there that would be a tough word so the thing is 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 I'm dreaming and I'm asking again for that rapid diagnostic test because I think it's going to make a difference in the the, the, the the less developed country, but it would make a difference in my ER in Montreal. And so I made that because I think it's a big driver. And then I really do think that we need to agree on the trigger to how to help fail state when they all look facing a health emergency and, and that we don't have to do that while it's happening. So we need to agree before that what would be the trigger to come and help and not just to pass the buck, you know, like we're doing right now with the migrants. We need a different model. And then last, I would just say that, and I agree somehow with, with Jeremy when he talks about to portray it as a market failure. Actually, there's not really a market failure per se with antibiotic because if we get the right antibiotic, people would purchase it. It's, it's, it, it's, 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 a, it's about, uh, um, for me, it's not more of, of, of the same in that respect. It's the fact that the, 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 it's, 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 it's all the model of, of, of the market that's what we need to fix. But it, it's not a market failure per se. People's, if we get the right uh, antibiotic, people's going to buy it. Mm. Huge demand and needs. Andrew, last word. Uh, <coughs> two or three things. I think member states need to keep the voice that they've discovered since Ebola and since Germany's lead on the AMR agenda. I think that makes the multilateral agencies way more powerful. Multilateral agencies can only go where the member states wants it to go. And I think we've seen a lot of benefit from that. But I really hope this doesn't just recede into yesterday's story and we move on to the next thing. Yes, because right. I think member states are really pivotal within this, yeah. uh, absolutely crucially. Um, you've got to start making some decisions. I mean, just to, we're going to go to a vaccine session right now. I'm going to talk about a proposal on biopreparedness, which we proposed a year ago. We could have had three or four vaccine research programs into rare disease commissioned by now, but nobody's made any decisions whether or not we should go forward or not. 
Now, it may be a terrible idea, in which case tell us it's a terrible idea and we'll stop talking about it, or tell us it's a good idea and let's do it. But I think we, we are, we're in a mode at the moment where we're all saying this is super important. Whenever something specific comes up, it, again, it typically is being pushed into a sequence of, well, let's have a year's reflection on it. Let's send another working group off to talk about it. And we're burning years up in this process. We probably get there in the end, but we're burning years up in the process. So, so I would really encourage member states to just be clear, make some choices. We're going to make some mistakes. We're going to get some things right, but we have to do some stuff. So I think moving into that phase, and I think really this conversation has really amplified how this is, if you really want to get ahead of this, it's, con it's definitely conservance. It's definitely whole system, agriculture as well as human health. It's definitely prevention, whether that's healthy living, clean, you know, washing hands, all of that, and it's vaccination. Within vaccination, to the question of how we move that forward, is we need to understand there are modern vaccination looks different technically from traditional vaccination, and somehow we as a society and regulators are going to have, we've got to, we've got to get ourselves comfortable with that step forward in technology. And we've got to somehow try and achieve a standard which says we've, we've ticked the boxes on this new set of innovation or not. And if we have, let's move forward. But at the moment, every new vaccine that's coming along is getting trapped in the kind of let's go back and recheck whether or not we're yet comfortable with adjuvant technology. There was no new adjuvants for 50 years. Now we've got new adjuvants. But somehow as a society and as a system, we've got to get ourselves comfortable or not, make the call or not. But that's the kind of area where we should be focused, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is, uh, this is the end. So let uh, 2016 be the year of decisions and actions. I think the roadmap is clear. We have enough studies and uh, working groups and all that. So to go. And uh, the hashtag would be, uh, it's not only about delivery of innovations, but also innovation in delivery. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah.